Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the Nonprofit Learning Lab for today's workshop. If you have any questions along the way for our presenters, you can type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, likely on the right-hand side of your screen. If you have any tech questions, you can also type them there. If you're interested in using live captions for today's workshop, you can use the link we'll send in the chat shortly. If you're interested in receiving the recordings and materials from today's free webinar, you can visit our free webinars page on the Nonprofit Learning Lab website, or you can send us an email at program at nonprofitlearninglab.org. And without further ado, I'll now hand it over to you, Belinda. Thank you so much, Priya. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. I'm so excited to talk to you today about a topic that I'm just really passionate about, social enterprise, which is a way to use the power of the marketplace to fuel social impact. So my name is Belinda Lee. I'm founder and chief consultant of CITA Partnership. We are a social impact consulting firm uh, focusing on uh, helping clients solve some strategy problems. Um, really, the niche is around the social enterprise area where stealing uh, purpose and profit. And so really excited to talk to you today. And uh, I was told I should probably turn off my camera for my presentation. So let me do that. So the today, what I hope to um, really help you kind of learn a little bit is to gain a better understanding of the definition of a social enterprise. What is it? Um, and then learn about the many different business models that a social enterprise can undertake. And I'll give you some case studies and examples to just highlight some of those models. And then really learn about what to consider as you explore starting a social enterprise, whether that's your first social enterprise or you, are, you have actually done a social enterprise and want to expand to another one or, or just have questions about the social enterprise model. And hopefully be able to start sketching out some business model ideas. So on that note, I would love to learn a little bit about you so I have a little poll at the beginning, um, just to help me understand a little bit where you are on this journey of social enterprise. Whether you've actually been operating one for a long time already and just have some kind of questions or curiosity uh, about this, uh, or you're starting a new social enterprise now or uh, not long ago, or you, perhaps you used to have a social enterprise but not anymore. Um, or maybe just curious in general. So I'll let the poll open a little bit. Maybe Priya can let me know when it's pretty much filled out. Okay, I think they're coming in. Okay, uh, looks like about, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was going to say the poll is filled out and the results are shared. Okay, great. Looks like about half of you is just curious about the topic. Great. I hope this is going to be helpful to you, but also the rest of you looks like a considering some social enterprise opportunities. Great. Started one not long ago. Um, been operating for a long time. All right, great. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a great mix. So I, I hope there's something for everyone here, but um, towards the end, I'll take questions and that's probably the most exciting part of this <laughs> webinar where we can do a discussion about some of your questions. Okay, so what is a social enterprise? Um, and here I provide a couple of definitions and there's uh, often a debate about what it is, but I thought I'll pull a couple of the definitions that a, a couple of organizations have used. The first one is from Social Enterprise Alliance. I actually happened to serve on their board and helped create this definition with my fellow board members. And it says that a social enterprise is an organization created for impact. It uses a sustainable and earned income business model with a governing structure focused on stated social or environmental goals. It invests a significant portion of its revenue, profit, or assets into expanding this state mission. Somewhat long, but uh, perhaps, perhaps a more succinct definition is by Social Venture Network, which is a social enterprise is a business whose purpose is to change the world for common good. And I've highlighted a couple of well, places with color uh, intentionally. So you see the kind of blue text is talking about the the, the way that these social social enterprises uh, generate earned income is through a business. 
So to put it plainly, selling some kind of service or products for a price. And so that's that's the, the way to generate the income. But even more importantly is the green tax, which is that social enterprise has got to be an organization created for impact. It, it's got to be purpose-centered um, because that is what is going to drive your all your decision making. Um, so the, the blue tax, the business, the earned income, the selling products and services is a means towards that end of creating social or environmental impact. And for all of you, assuming you're all nonprofits or working in the nonprofit sector, that's obviously true to your DNA. So that's great. That's kind of the boxes check for there. Um, but on that note, you know, social enterprise is actually agnostic to the legal structure. It could be nonprofits, for profits, um, benefit corporation, L3Cs, you know, different kind of legal structures. So, so particularly for those that are in some other legal structures, this is even more important to keep in mind. This social enterprise has got to be remaining to, to remain true to their mission so that when business decisions, tough business decisions uh, point are to be made, you have a North Star to, to those decisions. And I love this quote by a former CEO of Grayston Bakery. Uh, this is a case study we'll go through a little bit later. Um, they say, we don't hire people to bake brownies, they make brownies, but we bake brownies in order to hire people. The business is to fuel that purpose. So just want to kind of make that point. And then we'll dive into a little bit the uh, different social enterprise business models. There are many, many kinds, and the social enterprise could be one of these kinds or multiple of these kinds. So a uh, very common ones is employment social enterprises. Um, there are also kind of environmentally focused ones, the intermediate, uh, and just a, a different kind of models that I'll go through in case studies to just bring them to life a little bit for you. So let's start with employment social enterprises. This is a social enterprise that provides either transitional jobs or permanent jobs for populations with employment barriers. And often they would do so in conjunction with other supportive services as well as populations. And going to the first example. Um, so this is TROSA. My, my dashboard is kind of in my own way. <laughs> so this is TROSA, uh, which is an organization based in North Carolina. They provide multi-year residential program for individuals with substance use disorders to help them kind of recover from that and become um, uh, contributing members to the society through kind of vocational training, education, kind of wraparound services. And for them, they are a nonprofit and they're in terms of kind of the structure, the social enterprise is just simply part of the nonprofit programs. And I'll show you some other examples of a structure, of different structures. So their employment um, focus is transitional jobs. So they have a two-year program and they train individuals in these jobs and with the goal of transitioning them to long-term career to more permanent jobs. They have several businesses. They have moving and storage, thrift store, lawn care, and holiday sea lots. And they work on a, a peer model as well as they make sure the residents and graduates of the programs are the ones that actually manage and operate these businesses. So they're really learning more valuable skills through these jobs. Um, and this is where I want to bring in that point I made earlier, where the mission really is centered and therefore they, they make the business decisions based on that. So one example is that they were actually provided with a very lucrative business opportunity for a certain kind of work, but that kind of work requires that these individuals work uh, in solitude, uh, solo. And they decided to turn those opportunities down because for them, the peer-to-peer -peer support, working together in kind of in teams, is a very integral part to their rehab program and to their, um, to their mission, uh, because these individuals require that kind of support to really recover and build their skills, et cetera. And so they turn that down, even though that business opportunity is very ludicrous, it's just in, in opposition to their mission. So that's where really, again, just that mission-centered um, is key. 
why are you why are you doing this business right it's, it's not about making money it's about making money to support these individuals and using that working opportunity to support so that's one example. The other one I also mentioned briefly earlier, Grayson Bakery. So again, they make a lot of brownies um, and they are employment-based social enterprise as well, based out of New York. And they are actually a for-profit certified B Corp, but they are owned by a non-profit foundation and fully owned by this non-profit foundation parent. Um, so that's another kind of structure that you could consider. Uh, and they provide permanent jobs. So they, uh, again, they make a lot of brownies. They make about 7 million pounds a year for Ben and Jerry's and their products in stores and Whole Foods, et cetera, as well. And they use the open hiring model where there is no question asked uh, for these entry-level baker positions. Um, so no resume check, background check. If you are willing to work, if you are able to work, willing to work, um, you can be hired. Um, and they also provide wraparound services to help employees remove obstacles like childcare, housing. And their model is so successful that there are actually organizations reaching out to them to ask for their consulting help to, to teach them how to do open hiring. Um, and their turnover rate is just so much lower than industry range because of how they run their, their business. So in terms of the relationship with their nonprofit parents, Grayson Bakery pays the parent foundation a management fee to cover any share services and then any excess profits from the bakery operations is either directed to the foundation for the foundation's work or grant funding etc and or invested reinvested into the bakery. So that's how they are structured in this case. Okay so moving on to uh, kind of a tongue-in-cheek term for this side is Robin Hood. Um, really, it basically means selling uh, products or services to those who could afford to pay, often at a market price, and then redirecting that funding to then those to those who um, whom your, your clients, your participants, your you know, those individuals you are trying to assist. Sometimes they're paying customers um, using the same services as the beneficiaries. Sometimes they're not. Perhaps you are you open a high-end boutique clothes store, let's say. Uh, you sell those codes to to those who can pay um, and then use that funding for say a homeless shelter or you know, whatever the service you're paying. Sometimes it's the same. So uh, services the beneficial get so depends. So just to give you one example, um, in this case is a social service agency called Concordia Place and they serve multi-generation um, clients. Uh, especially um, important to that to the programs is an early learning line of services, and they have a lot of early learning centers, early childhood centers in uh, areas of Chicago actually, um, and they provide really high quality early childhood education to individuals who, on a sliding scale, uh, some are supported by say um, other funding sources. Uh, however, they realized that there is actually a huge requ requirement or huge um, demand for high quality childhood by any parents. So including those in the more middle market, upper market, where they are able to afford to, to pay private pay market rate uh, services. And they would like their children to get those services. So they decided to open up a more social enterprise model type of early childhood centers, really leveraging the same high quality curriculum and expertise, but um, but establishing it in areas where people can pay the market rate and, and, and ask for that price and really identifying that market demand. Uh, and then using that funding, extra, extra, extra funding to fund their social service programs. So this is um, both kind of a Robin Hood model, but also in terms of just expanding your audience. This is a great way to expand your audience to your mission, um, to a group of audience that perhaps would never have known about if you had stayed in certain neighborhoods. Now you're expanding to the neighborhood, your brand is out there, they understand your mission, they see your quality, 
and so they could potentially become your future champion for your mission as well. So that's another kind of intangible um, benefit of the social enterprise. So that's the example um, for kind of Robin Hood have a model. And then environmental impact focus, uh, there can obviously be many kinds in that, but basically they are social enterprises that exist to cultivate environmental stewardship or reduce environmental damage. And I'll just give you one example. There are also, of course, many other examples such as you know, waste recycling and, and so forth, uh, regenerative type of practices. But let me give you one example uh, about ocean connectors. They are out of San Diego, California. Their mission is to educate, inspire, and connect youth in underserved Pacific coastal communities through the study of migratory marine life so that they can cultivate um, really a future generation of individuals who, are, who care about the ocean and will protect the ocean. So they are nonprofits and they provide their program is to provide um, basically free education about the marine life to um, underserved fourth to sixth graders and providing them hands-on environmental education. And they traditionally were based, their funding is based on grants and donations, but they realized those alone really don't sustain the programs. So they began in 2015, the social enterprise businesses, which are the paid eco-tours. So they bring eco-tourists to do things like you know, kayaking, uh, watching bird, whale watching, etc. And they really do that building on top of their existing assets. They already have expertise, kind of like what we showed in Concordia, right? They have this expertise in, in conducting field trips. They know a lot about marine conservation. They have curriculum. So it's really just about adapting that um, to an educational eco-tour business. And they also already have existing partnerships with, for example, whale watching company, wildlife refuge, that they've been uh, leveraging for their educational program. So, so it's really a natural expansion of what they are already good at doing. And that's, that's the point that I will keep making is should you really build on what you have. And, and that would ensure you know, a little bit more uh, better possibility of success of your social enterprise. Uh, and then I think this is the final example is um, an interesting kind of uh, market connector intermediary role that you can also play as a social enterprise. It, it's basically an organization that facilitates trade relationships to help distribute product services, um, really open up expanded markets for others. Uh, so one example is uh, HHP Lyft, which is um, based in Chicago. And they actually themselves have a program that 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 have a business, a social enterprise that hires directly individuals who um, have challenges in finding on, um, employment. But they really started, so that was a little newer program, it called LiftWorks, the last bullet here. But they actually started really as an intermediary, and they still are doing that uh, as a big part of their, their work. So what they do is to support fair trade artisans, social enterprises from around the world globally. Um, all these uh, artisans and enterprises globally have this common goal of providing jobs to those with barriers to employment. So what HXP Lift is to, does is to play the intermediary role of connecting these organizations and individuals with um, much bigger markets, such as the corporations like HP, um, I think perhaps Google, um, just a lot of these large corporations to connect them to sell their products into these corporations for, for example, incentive products, reward products, like say, let's say a bag with the, the HP logo on it. Um, but that bag also has a story. It's made by these social enterprises, fair trade artisans and so forth. So helping them open that market that they would never have had been able to reach before by themselves. So that's an interesting um, model as well for social enterprise. Okay, so just a few slides to wrap up is the question of, is it really a good idea to have a social enterprise? Um, no, I, I would be the first one to say running a social enterprise is not easy. Uh, it, it's running a business, any business is not that easy. Um, and then on top of that, you have a mission um, that you need to fulfill and it just makes it 
even more challenging in many levels. So how do you, what are like some of the key feasibility questions you should ask yourself and do some research around? So first and foremost is how well does that new venture align with your mission values? And to put it another way, why? Why are you considering doing this social enterprise? Um, does doing this social enterprise, is that gonna help achieve your mission? And how we, how is it gonna help achieve your mission? Like, really think about that and, and, and not just think about doing a business for the sake of doing business and thinking that, oh, it's just gonna make some money. Um, it, it's, it's about really aligning it better. So if your mission is about lifting individuals out of poverty less, then perhaps a business that hires and trains them could be a good fit. Like trying to find that alignment as much as possible uh, to really amplify your impact. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier a few times, right, does the new venture really leverage existing core competencies? If you already have that core competency, you're really just expanding a little bit, building on top of it, building existing relationships, not just your core competency um, and channels, uh, etc. So, um, what do you re already have? Already good at doing? Sometimes um, folks kind of think, well, let's just open a coffee shop or let's just print some t shirts. Right? It sounds easy, but actually, those are very competitive businesses and if you don't have any experience in doing this, it's, it's a challenge and it could be a distraction to your force core programs. And then is there strong support from key players? You, you are gonna need a lot of partnerships, support, um, ranging from the board, leadership staff, funders. Um, so uh, the board side is actually interesting. In my experience, um, I have this last bullet that says beware of over eager board members. That's, uh, that's because often board members uh, consist of private um, operation uh, leaders, or maybe people working in banks, or you know just commercially minded individuals. They might see that, and we've seen that in our clients. Like they, are, they are very excited by this idea and say, okay, great, this is a way to make money. Um, but often you kind of, that's great, but sometimes they might go a little bit over the line and just say, okay, let's just make money but not, not remembering that there is a mission behind it. So you can't just keep, you have to balance those viewpoints and kind of pull them back a little bit to say, wait, but there is this mission. So let's, let's make sure that making money part is really supporting the mission in an aligned way. On the other hand, for staff and perhaps funders as well, they're, they're, we've seen skepticism, uh, you know, like a staff might say, we've been serving uh, clients been providing our services for free. Why are we suddenly charging anybody money? That's against the mission of the nonprofit. So it's really about bringing them along, helping them understand the margin is to support the mission. It's not about detracting from the mission. This is to strengthen that mission and, and perhaps bring them in earlier to help kind of develop that idea together, have candid conversations about um, the benefits, but also the risks. Um, and just showing them that, bringing them along the process and showing them some of the research, the idea. Uh, so um, it, it's important to kind of bring people along. This kind of is my point here. And then, um, you know, internally, are you able to set up the needed operating system? You, you might need something different. You might need a sales system, um, maybe a sales force, a CRM, or other uh, uh, point of sale system you could do in retail. You, know, you, you need to kind of build those basic infrastructure. And as you scale your business, you, you then start investing in more robust systems and processes. And now are you willing to recruit and train the needed staff? Often uh, the, the talents and expertise you need to run a business is not necessarily the same, sometimes quite different than those needed to run a nonprofit program. So the kind of willingness to look at the, the needs and be open to uh, investing in new staff, uh, perhaps even a new um, CEO for that particular program, for the social enterprise, to run the business, different skill sets. And that includes the board also. You, you might want to recruit some new board members with some of those expertise to help. And are you willing and able to instill an entrepreneurial culture? Um, this is quite important, but right? running a business, you need to kind of run 
really with the market needs and find out what is the demand and changing situation in the market and adapt. Um, you need to be pretty nimble usually. And sometimes if you are a social enterprise out of established by a large uh, already established nonprofit, it could become a challenge if you really don't understand that. We've, uh, I've heard of an example where a large, really large nonprofit started this social enterprise, and then, but then they require the social enterprise to still go through all the bureaucratic processes of approval, um, a lot of steps internally to, to do anything, to make any change. And eventually it was a failed enterprise uh, because of that. They just couldn't react fast enough to the market situation. And then have you gotten legal advice? Um, this, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm just uh, putting it out there, but it is important to just think about the legal forms, the uh, implication of say unrelated business income tax, the risk of those and so forth. And then finally, just it's, it's some external factors, you know, the, a very typical business questions like would there be sufficient market demand um, at your price point, um, at your margin, how strong is the competition, can you compete successfully, what exactly is unique about your competitive advantages, financial analysis, break even, how much you need at the front end, op ongoing operating um, funding and so forth. And then what are the potential risks, not just to your financial risk, but also your brand and reputation risk. Especially as a nonprofit, starting a social enterprise business. Uh, again, even the outside world, I was mentioning the staff and funders might have questions about this. The outside world may also have this question about why are you selling products? And then also in the experience they have in interacting with your product and services, negative experiences could potentially reinforce their perhaps prejudice view of let's say the individuals you're trying to help. Like if the service is, um, is not up to par, if there's some negative experiences, they could kind of come back and say, well, they, they then they don't really trust your mission either or individuals. And then are there any additional intangible benefits? So as I mentioned, social enterprise is not just about making money. Uh, it, it certainly helps. But it, there's a lot of other intangible that you should really think about and build your social enterprise with that mindset. Expanding to new audience, like I mentioned earlier, perhaps it earns you a seat at a new table that helps you with other advocacy efforts. Um, perhaps you're gonna start sitting in some of those decision-making tables that you never did before. And you know other, other ways to think about what other benefits are besides directly the revenue making. So I would strongly encourage you to really conduct market research, find ways to really test the feasibility in small pilot runs um, and, and kind of learn as you go. Uh, again, it's not easy. So um, really thinking through how you would make it a success is important. So just the final key takeaway, social enterprise can, as you have seen some of the case studies, can be super impactful. But again, it's not easy, not for everyone. When it works, it really works, um, but sometimes it doesn't. So make sure the social enterprise is truly helping you achieve a mission limit. That's one of the really important things. Do not have it become a distraction to your mission, not a mission drift. Make sure it truly is helping you achieve a mission. And remember that in the open marketplace, the mission might open doors, or maybe to, if you're equally uh, in quality and price with your competitors, you have that mission could be a little tiebreaker. Um, but you, you've got to provide competitive products and services, competitive quality, competitive pricing, uh, competitive service, uh, service quality as well. And just be sure to understand the risk. There are always risks any new venture, business venture. And be ready to fail fast, learn fast, and pivot when needed is the entrepreneur. Okay, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I will leave this slide up here and ask for any questions. Hi, Belinda. I had a question sent to me directly. Um, they said, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned multiple different social enterprise models. Do you recommend any resources in addition to your workshop to better understand these models? Hmm. I would say just go out and 
Google them <laughs> and look for them. Um, there are many examples out there that you can kind of find and just read read about them on their website. You, you could even contact them. Uh, the, often I have really good experience like reaching out to other social enterprises and asking them questions. They're very good. So um, there are also like membership organizations such as the one, just a shameless plug, um, <laughs> the Social Enterprise Alliance that I'm on the board of. You could join organizations like that and really do uh, kind of reach out to other members and find out more and have a peer support system. Wonderful, thank you. And then we also had a compliment sent in from Sue. She said she's so grateful for the excellent information provided in bite-sized pieces. Thank you. Oh, great, thank you. It looks like that is the end for the Q&A portion of the webinar. Thank you, Belinda. Oh. This has okay. come to a close. Um, okay, thank I, you. I understand that some people were unable to see the entirety of the slides. Please email us at program at nonprofitlearninglab.org if you're interested in receiving the recording and the slide deck from today's free webinar. You can also receive this information by visiting our free webinars page on the Nonprofit Learning Lab website. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. And again, thank you, Belinda, for educating our community. Thank you, everyone. Have a great one.